Come on in, everybody. Announcements and the message. Yep. It's a f full time job. No, I'm not, definitely not doing worship. No. Uh, let's see here. All right. Well, welcome to Horizon Christian Fellowship. Um, we're obviously, some of us are back from family camp. We had a great time. There's a lot of fish caught. Right, Mr. Dave? Yeah, Dave caught, not most of them, some of them. A lot of fish released, caught, catch and release. Put, yep, yep. Yeah, we put a lot of, uh, on Thursday, we put a lot of rounds down range. Nobody got shot, that's good. So we had a, we had a really good time. So um, why doesn't uh, everybody get up and greet one another? Then we'll get started.
All right, all right. Welcome all. Welcome to those of you out there on, uh, I was going to say Facebook, but the web, the World Wide Web. Um, welcome to Horizon, virtually or in person. Um, glad to see everybody that, uh, how, many, how many folks here went to family camp? Yeah, yeah. And for those that didn't, make note, they're all here still. They didn't get hurt. Nobody died. I, Lennon might have a few bruises, but they're self-inflicted. That's, that's on him. Not, you know. There was a couple of nights of Capture the Flag that got a little intense, I'm just going to say. A little intense. So, but it's all good. It's all good. Um, all right. I'm going to just go through the announcements, and then we'll, uh, we'll do some worship. So, uh, again, like last week, most of these are women's ministry sponsored. So, um, the first one is the women's ministry is sponsoring a movie night. Uh, I think it's next Saturday. It's July 23rd, if I'm not mistaken. That is this upcoming Saturday at 6.30 p.m. Yes, from 6.30 to 10. And the movie is a small group. And it's PG-13 and snacks will be provided. So please come to the church. We'll all sit in the nice air-conditioned sanctuary here and, and enjoy a movie. Uh, the next thing also for the... Now, this one I think is just for the ladies. It is Be Our Guest. And it's to come and meet the women's leadership. And you can find out about all their upcoming events, more so than just the movie night that I just mentioned. Um, so Be Our Guest is Saturday, August 6th at 6.30 p.m. There's going to be food, there'll be a craft, and there's going to be great fellowship. Uh, and child care will be provided. So that can be important. So come meet the women's leadership on uh, Saturday evening, August 6th at 6.30. Um, and then I'm just going to do the next women's uh, thing, women's ministry, that they're sponsoring is a day at the beach. So that is Saturday, August 13th, and that's at Big Soda Lake in Bear Creek, Bear Creek Lake Park. Uh, that's Saturday, August 13th from 1 to 5. So that's in the afternoon, Saturday afternoon. Uh, the cost for that is simply $10 to buy a day pass, and that's per vehicle. So that's one of those that you... Go ask all your friends to jump in your car or jump in their car, and then you can just split the 10 bucks. Uh, and seniors and persons with disabilities are only $5. So for you young kids, go find a senior, have them drive you there, and then it's like gonna cost you 50 cents. I mean, there you go. Only a finance guy would think of that. I don't know why. All right, so that is August 13th, one to five. It's, um, it is bring your own snacks, bring your own lawn chair, bring your own beach towels. So you, know, you, gotta, you gotta outfit yourself, but everybody's welcome to that one. Um, but except for pets, don't bring your pets. Pets are not allowed. That's probably a uh, Bear Creek Lake thing. Um, uh, and then backpack outreach. So this means school is on the horizon. Backpack outreach and distribution. So it's time to donate backpacks along with cash or checks or gift cards. Those gift cards need to be to Walmart or Target, by the way. Um, and just put, if you're going to write a check, put outreach um, on the memo line of your check, and you can put those either in the boxes or in the black uh, mailbox there in the coffee shop. Um, but please do not purchase any supplies on your own, although you might think you know what to buy, you don't. And I'm just telling you that because the schools have very specific needs, and they won't, um, they won't accept things that, out, uh, that are outside of their, um, I think, very structured list. So. So as long as you supply either um, gift cards or checks or, or uh, money, cash, um, gift cards to Walmart, Target, then the, uh, the staff here at Horizon goes and purchases everything that uh, is, is required. So just to give you a, a couple of statistics here, there are 90 plus students in need of backpacks at both Centennial and Goddard Middle School. And that comes to a little over $4,000 to outfit those 90 plus students. Um, and if you're interested, the distribution of those backpacks is going to be Sunday, August 7th at 1 p.m. So um, after church on August 7th at 1 p.m., if you're available to serve, please sign up at the information booth, which is right down that hall. And um, yeah, online giving. For those that want to give online, you can um, just go to our website, horizondenver.com. And at the top of the page, I think on the right-hand side, there's a button that says Give. And you just select that button. 
So now I'm going to pray for the offering. Dear Lord, Father, we are so blessed by you and not to take it for granted that um, we live in a place where we can come freely. We don't worry about persecution. We don't worry about somebody storming our doors and, and telling us to disperse. That we can come, that we can worship you, Lord, that we can go through your word and, and divide it rightly, and that we can fellowship. Lord, we're grateful for those things, and I do want to lift up the tithes and offerings to you that it is all your provision anyways, and that we bring it back into your storehouses to bring you glory, and that it would just further your kingdom here in Littleton, here at Horizon, in the surrounding communities. We just love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. <laughs> Join me in worship. My 
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring, but only trust in Jesus' name. is built on nothing less than Jesus word and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest way but only trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, and Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord.
bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name.
nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only Better than you, Lord, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens, you turn bones into armies, you turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only. Thank you, Lord, so much for your son and for your spirit to be with us this morning. And Lord, we just offer you this time as a, a moment that we just um, lay out before you to worship you and seek you and Lord, just soak you in and uh, Lord, prepare us for what you have uh, for the upcoming week. And thank you, Lord, for the blessings of everyone being able to travel to family camp and come back safely. And we pray for those that haven't come back yet, Lord, to, to return safely as well. And, and Lord, we just, uh, we just give you time this morning and we love you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Can you guys turn me down a little? Can you guys can hear me okay if we turn it down? I, I hear white noise behind us. And I, don't, I don't want you guys to fall asleep with the white noise, okay? So as long as you can hear me and as long as I'm being recorded so I don't have to do this again to an empty room, then that is fantastic. Um, so let me uh, get the message pulled up. The, uh, every year when we come back from family camp, I can... Um, I can tell if it was a good camp because about 20, 30 minutes as I'm, as I'm driving up over Cottonwood, I look to my right and my wife is sound asleep taking a nap and I look in the back seat and in this particular year it was Reese and Samantha out cold. So that tells me it was a good camp. Everybody's exhausted, right? I mean, we're coming home. I did not fall asleep. I was driving, so we made it. So, and then I think Reese, I don't know, is Reese here? Where is Reese? Is he here? He, he just let, he, he, I think he was still so tired when we got home. They didn't sleep the whole way, but he thanked me for my hostility instead of my hospitality. So I was like, all right, I'm okay with that. I mean, so, yeah, yeah, so, yep, yeah, so. Anyways, um, we're going to be in, uh, in Romans 9 and in Matthew 20 this morning. So if you want to uh, put a bookmark at uh, Matthew 20 and then open to Romans 9, that's where we're going to be. 
And uh, as you're doing that, um, I, I'm going to tell you that the, the, the primary focus of today's message is going to be free will versus predestination. And uh, that's a pretty heavy topic. Um, it's probably not one that I can successfully do reverence to in one message, but we're going to try. Why not? And if nothing else, I pray that this would get you to be thinking. Think about this kind of stuff. Um, I, I saw this, I think this was a couple weeks ago. It might have been on a break point or something like that, but um, listen to the statistic. Americans in 2021, last year, Americans streamed a mind-blowing 15 million years worth of digital content. 15 million years worth of digital content is what Americans streamed. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I did not, in 2021, pop on Netflix or, you know, Amazon Prime, but that seems like a lot of years worth of digital content that we are streaming as a culture. And it got me thinking, imagine what our culture, what our country would look like if we spent that same amount of time thinking about the Bible, researching the Bible, even challenging the Bible. I mean, I, you know, I just, I think it would be different. I think things would be different. So, so I tend to be a deeper thinker. Um, and so I think about stuff like free will versus predestination uh, or what we might call God's sovereignty. So let's pray and we'll get into this. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, we lift up this morning to you, Lord. I pray that uh, as, we, as we take on this bit of a cerebral, philosophical topic, Lord, that, um, that we would do it justice, Lord, that we would, um, we would seek your glory in this, Lord, and, and that, um, that in particular the, the, the notes that I have, that they would be the things I'm supposed to be sharing with the body this morning, that they're your your thoughts, Lord, are just, I'm just your mouthpiece. And um, I do want to lift up this morning, um, I did learn that there was a, a flash flood here in, uh, I think it was in Larimer County, County or somewhere, that um, there was lives lost, Lord, and um, tragic. Um, sudden loss of life is, is always difficult to deal with. And we lift those people up, the families that were impacted by that, the friends, um, the loved ones, Lord, we lift them up to you. Pray that they would seek you if they didn't know you before. I pray that you would give them a peace and a comfort. And we lift all this up to you in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So this topic of free will versus predestination. Um, first of all, I need to tell you that this is not a salvation issue. Okay? So I'm going to talk about it. It's sort of necessary to talk about Calvinism versus Armenianism, Armenianism, and I'll share those with you. There's five points to each of those. But I want to make it clear for those of you out there that are thinking like, oh, I, I better be a Calvinist or I better be an Armenian. You don't have to be. It's not a salvation issue. They are attempts to describe salvation, to, to understand how we are saved, but it does not impact your salvation whatsoever, okay? I think I can... I think you know, but I'm going to state it anyways. The keys to your salvation are understanding that you're a sinner, repenting once you realize that you're a sinner, repenting of that sin, and seeking for the one Savior that can save you from sin, and that is Jesus Christ. Knowing that there is only one way to God, and it is his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And what he did on the cross is where we get our salvation. That's what saves us. That's what washes us clean. Those are the points that are critical to your salvation. So when we talk about Calvinism and Arminianism, those don't really have anything to do with whether you're saved or not. They simply try to describe it. And I'm going to use Romans 9 and Matthew 20 to talk through it. And I'm just going to share with you that I don't believe either one is absolutely correct. And I'm thankful that neither Arminius or John Calvin are standing here because I'd probably get shot down pretty darn quick. Because... If I'm a deep thinker, those guys are way deeper. But let me share with you, for those of you that aren't familiar with what Calvinism is and what Arminianism is. So there's five points to each. I'm going to go through Calvinism first because Arminius developed his five points um, uh, as, a, as a counter to Calvinism. So Calvinism, point number one, Calvinism says there is total depravity. This, says, this, this teaching says that we have a total inability to save ourselves. Because the fall in the Garden of Eden was a total fall. 
Okay? You, you have, if you're a Calvinist, you cannot save yourself. You have no ability to have any part in salvation. The second point of Calvinism speaks to unconditional election. This says that the remedy for salvation lies totally with God and that God has predestined those he will save. And man has no part in that. Okay, in other words, there is a pre-elect, there's a finite number of souls that God has preordained to be saved, and no matter what, those that are the, the elect, even if they don't want to be saved, they're going to be saved. And those that maybe aren't saved, even if they want to, they can't be. There is no free will, and there is a preordained, predetermined number of lives, number of souls that will be saved. That's Calvinism. Point number three is in regards to limited atonement. So this says that Christ died on the cross. So Calvinists believe in Jesus Christ. They believe Christ died on the cross, that, that everything I just went through about salvation, that he, his, his work on the cross is what saves sinners. But Calvinists believe in limited atonement, which says that Christ died on the cross to save only a certain number of sinners whom the Father had already set his free electing love upon. Okay? So Calvinists would say that Christ died to save a certain number of people. An Armenian would say that Christ died to save all men, or they might say that Christ died to save no one in particular. And we're going to get to Armenianism here in a second. Let me get through the last two points of Calvinism. Calvinism also says that there is irresistible grace. This says that the call of the Holy Spirit cannot be frustrated, that it is irresistible. Once saved, the Holy Spirit works in that person, and it cannot be frustrated no matter what. And then lastly, Calvinists believe in what's known as the perseverance of the saints. This says that you cannot lose your salvation. So for those of you that are maybe not familiar, the, what I just ran through, the acronym is TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. T, total depravity, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement, I, irresistible grace, P, perseverance of the saints. It's an easy way to remember it if you're taking notes, okay? So Calvinism is very much on this path of there is no free will and you are predetermined. There's a preordained number of souls that will be saved. And they have no part in that salvation. And once saved, they cannot lose their salvation. Now Arminius comes along and believes that's a little too harsh. So Arminius says his first point is there is free will. In other words, man can choose to receive the gospel and exercise his own faith. Armenians believe the gospel will be spread to everyone, but each person has a choice to make. Do they or do they not receive the gospel message? They have a part in their salvation. So you see how that counters with the first point of Calvinism in, ter to in terms of total depravity. Conditional election is the second point of Armenianism. Conditional election says that God knows who will respond to the gospel and has therefore pre-elected them based on his foreknowledge of their response to the gospel. Okay, so that's what's known as conditional election, which is obviously counter to unconditional election on the Calvinist side. Then you have the third point of Arminianism is universal redemption or general atonement. Remember, Calvinists think, of, think in terms of limited atonement. There's a limited number of lives. But Armenians say that there is general atonement. In other words, Christ died to save all men, but only on the condition that they believe in Jesus Christ. The fourth point of Armenianism is that the Holy Spirit can be thwarted by free will. The regeneration of the Holy Spirit in the person can be thwarted by the person, by the free will of that person. Okay? And then lastly, Armenians believe that you can fall from grace, that you can lose your salvation. Okay? So, you have Calvinists, you have Armenians, or Armenianism. Now, I personally, and I believe Lonnie believes this too, but you can ask him when he gets back from vacation, but we did have a chat about this up at family camp. I don't think all of those are, I'm not totally an Armenian, I'm not totally a Calvinist. And I'll tell you that the, I believe in free will, I believe in conditional election, but I don't believe that you can lose your salvation. So I'm sort of like a Calvinist, but not really, I'm kind of an Armenian too. So, so I would tell them both, yes. Like if somebody asked me which one's right, I'd say yes and no. So, 
All right, so I have to share that with you because as I start going through Scripture, and hopefully you got into Romans 9, you got your finger there because we're going to get into this now, but that is the backdrop for a lot of these Scriptures. And I will tell you, you can go a lot further with Scripture. There's a ton of Scriptures that back up Calvinism. There's a ton more that I'm going to go through that will back up Armenianism and, and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. So I, again, I would encourage you, do not contribute to that 15 million years worth of streaming content. Just get into the good old word right here. So, Romans 9. And by the way, before we get into, we're, we're going to eventually, Paul is going to get onto this topic of, of uh, predestination, that kind of thing. But let's get into the first part of Romans 9, which is a little different. Uh, it talks about um, love, I think. So he says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Paul is basically saying here that if he could, he would be accursed from Christ if it would save his countrymen. He would die, he would, compl- he would eternally separate himself from Christ if it meant that his countrymen would come to be believers. See, he's talking about Jews. Those are his countrymen. He's talking about Jews that either are in the flesh or they're following their made-up laws that they actually added to the Old Testament law. And they're following those rather than follow Christ. And Paul is saying, I, I wish that I myself could be accursed if, if, if it would save my brethren. Now, the interesting thing about this, that on the surface doesn't seem that remarkable. But let me share a couple of verses out of Acts with you. If you guys can pull up the first slide, Acts 14, 19. These are the guys he's talking about. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Acts 21, 27. Can we pull that one up? Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. And it wasn't to pat him on the back. It wasn't. The last one, Acts 23, 12. These are... In Acts, this is the, the, the record of Paul's missionary journeys, right? Acts 23, 12. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would rather eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. These are the very Jews that Paul leads in Romans 9 with. It says, I wish I would be a curse from Christ if it would lead them to Christ. I, I find that pretty darn amazing. Right? It's, it's pretty easy, I think, to, to try to make a covenant with God and say, Lord, I, like, I would separate myself from you if only my wife or only my brother or only like, family whom you love, dear friends, lifelong friends. Yes, I get that. But how about somebody that threw a rock through your window while you're driving down the highway or whatever? How about somebody that you just can't stand at work? I'm sure we all have some of those. Or that neighbor who's like constantly not doing what they're supposed to do. Maybe they put their trash in your yard or something. I don't know. Really hard to go, huh. Lord, I would separate myself from you if only they would know you. So one of the questions this morning is where does Paul get this kind of love? I mean, where, where does this come from? Well, if you skip ahead to chapter 10... I don't have a slide for this, but if you're in 9, it's not that hard to go to Romans 10. Just look at that first verse. In Romans 10, verse 1, Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. That's where he gets the love, through prayer. Through prayer and spending time with the Lord. And in praying for them and spending time with the Lord, That's where I think you get that kind of love. Something happens when you pray for people who you really don't like. It changes your countenance. It changes your heart towards them. Another example in Scripture is Moses. When he comes down from Mount Sinai, you guys probably remember the the account here. He spent 40 days with God. This is where God gives him, he's on Mount Sinai, and God gives him all the instruction on how to build the tabernacle, how how to build the table, showbread. He gives him all these instructions right? 40 days. And he comes down from the mountain, and you know what he's carrying? Ten Commandments, right? He's carrying two tablets. The Ten Commandments are written on those by the hand of God. 
and he sees Israel, he sees the nation of Israel, and what are they doing? Yeah, they're dancing and singing around a golden calf. Golden calf! Moses gets so mad, he throws the tablets down, breaks them. Just literally, not, not like he broke the Ten Commandments, but like he did. But then he says something in Exodus 32, 32 that is very familiar to our text here in Romans 9. He says, yet now, if you will forgive them their sin, but if not, I pray. Blot me out of your book, which you have written. Sounds a lot like Paul in Romans 9. See, Moses just spent 40 days with the Lord in the presence of God. And Paul, in a similar fashion, constantly praying for his brethren. See, I believe, since we're not going to be on Mount Sinai and getting instruction from the Lord, our way to do that is through prayer. And two things happen if you spend that kind of time with the Lord. First, like I mentioned, it changes your heart towards those you're praying for, whether they are loved ones or whether they are people you really cannot stand. It changes your heart. It makes you more tender, more kind-hearted, and more long-suffering. But the other thing it does is it brings you in alignment with Christ's command. Remember the first two? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, to love your neighbor. The person who bugs you. Your neighbor is not literally the, the, the family or the person living next door. It's the person you work with. It's the person who's driving in front of you on I-25. It's that person. Right? So Paul gives us a wonderful example here. Going on in verse 4 of Romans 9, he's talking about his countrymen, but now he's going to define them for us. Lest there is any confusion who Paul is referencing here, he says, who are Israelites, verse 4, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. These are the Israelites that Paul is talking about who pertain to the adoption. This means Israel was adopted by God to be his people. This word glory here, the glory, refers to God going before Israel in the wilderness as a cloud of smoke during the day to protect them from the hot sun and a pillar of fire at night. That's what this word glory represents. That's what, that's what that means. And then we know the covenants, right? We talked about several weeks, months ago, we talked about the Abrahamic covenant when we went through the life of Abraham that God made a covenant through Abraham with Israel. Obviously, the giving of the law through Moses. We had God gave Israel the Old Testament law. And then the service of God. Israel was to be in service to God. Their task was to show the world who God is, to bring God to the rest of the world, to be in service to God. And therein lie the promises of God to be blessed by the Lord, to follow his commandments. So that's who Paul is talking about when he says, I wish I could be accursed from Christ if only these countrymen, these Jews, these Israelites. In verse 5, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. The fathers of the Israelites, we know, they're Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David. This is literally the lineage. These are the great men of the Old Testament, but these are the fathers of Israel, but also the lineage through which Christ comes. That's why it says, according to the flesh, Christ came. And Paul ends this in verse 5 with an amen. And it might seem a little odd, but I'm going to explain it here without having to go through the entire book of Romans, because I don't have that kind of time. Romans 1 through 8 is Paul giving you the building blocks of salvation. So there's, there's a distinct shift in the book of Romans. One through book, the, the, the um, first eight chapters are the building blocks of salvation. Now Paul is changing his line of thinking, and he's going to address the Israelites. Okay, so, it's at the, it, so at the beginning of chapter 9, where he's changing his thinking, he's now going to focus on the Israelites, on the people of Israel. He's going to lead with a prayer. So the first five verses, if you read them in, in continuity instead of breaking them apart like I did, he's going to pray for the Israelites that they would come to Christ. He wants that so badly that he would leave Christ if they would come. And he concludes the prayer with an amen. 
That's why you find the amen right there. Now in verse 6, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. So Paul is simply saying here that not all Israelites have rejected Christ as the Messiah. Some have, some have not. Some stop at the Old Testament and don't recognize Christ as their Lord and Savior. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. Remember now, Paul is addressing Jews. So they know Abraham. They know the account. And if you remember from when we went through the life of Abraham, Paul brilliantly is referencing Abraham to say, listen, not all are the seed of Abraham. Because we know that Abraham had a son that God didn't recognize. Remember Abraham and Sarah decided, hey, we don't want to wait in the Lord. Sarah says, hey, why don't you take my maidservant Hagar? They do that, and then Ishmael comes along. That's the reference here to the children of the flesh. But God did promise Abraham a son. It said, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And that's Isaac. So there's two layers here to what Paul is saying to the Jews. One is, just because you think you're the seed of Abraham, if you're from Ishmael's line, that's not so. But the other part that Paul is talking about here is, just because you were born a Jew doesn't mean that you follow Christ. In other words, you cannot be born into this. Okay? So, just like today when Paul says, not all who are Israel are, are Israel, not all who claim to be Christian are Christian. Just coming to Horizon doesn't make you a Christian. Just like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Just doesn't. You have to choose it. You're not born into it. It's through faith by His grace that we're adopted into God's family. Moving on in verse 10, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children, not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So we see here the, the, the similar story continuing. In other words, Rebekah was Isaac's wife. So Abraham has Isaac. Isaac gets married to Rebekah. They have two children. Well, two that are referenced here. Not yet being born. Esau and Jacob. And it said, God says, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Paul, on the one hand, is telling Israel that it's through God's sovereignty that they are descendants of Abraham. Because you go Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob. Okay? But Isaac wasn't the only son of Abraham. There was another one, Ishmael. And Jacob wasn't the only son of Isaac. There was Esau. So it's through God's sovereignty. Now note here that it talks about God according to election. The election here speaks of an election to service, not an election of salvation. And I would point to you that it says the older shall serve the younger. See, Israel was to be in service to God. They were, they were God's elect to be in service to God. To carry the gospel message, to show the world the God of Israel. But we're starting to see this concept here of God's sovereign nature and this idea of pre-election. And like I said, we're going to unpack this a bit more. Hopefully. Verse 14. Paul, ha he, ha he has a rhetorical question. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. Why would Paul ask this question at this point? Because, see, these verses can be very problematic for some. Because it says in the parenthetical statement in verse 11, for the children not yet being born. See, Jacob and Esau hadn't been born yet. And God says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. 
That doesn't seem fair to, for a loving God to say something like that, right? How could God do that? Well, I would submit to you it's because God is sovereign. See, I don't believe that the mystery is that God hated Esau. I think it's that he loved Jacob. That's the mystery to me. If you read through the account, you'll understand Jacob was a bit of a conniver. He was a bit of a trickster. If you know the story, he literally tricked Esau out of his birthright for a bowl of soup. It sounds like two brothers, by the way. I mean, I just, I don't have sons, but that sounds exactly like brothers to me, like for a bowl of soup, tricked him out of his birthright. But Esau, by the way, was, was no champion of the gospel either. He was only concerned with carnal things. God knows this. God knows this before it happens. So God's sovereignty means that he knew this even before they were born. But Paul goes on and he answers his own question. Verse 15, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. When does God say this to Moses? It's in the account when he comes down from Mount Sinai. It's a little bit later in Exodus. Exodus 33, 19, if we can pull that one up. Then he said, capital H, this is God, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Why does God do this? See, the sovereignty of God means by definition that he's Lord over all creation. And as a sovereign God, he exercises his rule. The characteristics of God mean that his authority is perfect, it is just, and it is righteous. Now we all know, I believe, I'm going to tell you this, God is omniscient. It means he knows everything. And he's omnipotent. It means he's all-powerful. He's more powerful than whoever you can think of. He's more powerful. More powerful than the devil, than Thor, you name it, he's more powerful than that. You know, you, whatever you can dream up, he's more powerful than it. We generally don't struggle with those concepts, omniscience and omnipotence. But omnipresence is a tough one, at least for me. Because what omnipresence says is that God exists everywhere at all times simultaneously. So if you think about that for any length of time, it means that he, God, is not constrained by time or space. He does not experience things the way we do. We experience things very linearly. There is no way around that. What I mean by that is last week, I was getting ready for family camp. I got ready for family camp. I packed the truck. We drove up to family camp. We experienced family camp, and then we come back. That's not how it happens with God. He does it all at the same time. And for God, he can be here, and he can be at family camp all at the same time. So space and time don't, they don't constrain God. And that's a really hard thing to wrap your mind around. Because it means, if I go a bit larger than that, it means that he was there when the pyramids were built in Egypt. But it also means that he was there last summer, two summers ago, when all the riots happened. And it means he was there in 1945 when we stormed the beaches of Normandy. He was there. All at the same time, and for God, they all occurred. Not linearly, which, right, kind of blows your mind. But because he's a triune God, get this. Because we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, while he's in control sovereignly, it is a very personal, loving, gracious relationship that he offers. He's not some white-bearded dude up there throwing lightning bolts down. That's not God. It's not the God of the Bible, anyways. So then Paul addresses this further in verse 16. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. See, the election of God is not based on works. This is what Paul is saying. It's not something that you earn or that you work for or that you run for, he says. But it's based on God's grace and mercy and on our faith. If we can pull up Ephesians 2 our favorite book. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
It's important to realize it's by God's grace. It's God who shows grace that you have been saved through your faith. It's not God's faith, it's your faith. But God's showing you grace. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. In other words, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Right? Imagine if it was works, it's not, but imagine if it was, then it's almost like as long as you check the boxes, no matter what God wants, you can still get into heaven. But that's not how it works. It doesn't work that way. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, this starts to get to this concept of God's pre-knowledge. He knows the gospel will be shared, right? I don't know what your eschatology is, but once the gospel is shared with everyone, and whoever picks the gospel, to me, that's when the rapture happens. But we have to choose it. Not all are going to choose it. It's by our faith. See, just because God is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, it doesn't obviate our free will. I think people struggle with that. We still have to choose to have faith. But God knows who's going to choose. But it doesn't take away the choice. And look at what he says in in, uh, verse 17 then. He starts to go to the Old Testament. He says, For the Scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show... Uh, sorry, that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills he hardens. See, in the scripture account, Pharaoh has basically 10 choices. There's 10 plagues. With each successive plague, God is giving Pharaoh a choice. Let my people go, follow me, or don't. And each time, Pharaoh doesn't. And each time, what happens? His heart gets a little bit more hardened towards God each time but each time Pharaoh has a choice I mean God is omnipotent he could have just wiped Pharaoh out he could have just snapped his fingers and skipped right to there wasn't an 11th plague but he could have skipped to the plague that just wiped them all out but he doesn't he gives Pharaoh the opportunity to make a choice see the miracle here is that our sovereign God lovingly allows free will to choose he created us He didn't have to create us this way. The other aspect, though, about the Exodus account, and God sort of, or it sort of addresses this, Paul addresses this, therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens, that his name may be declared in all the earth. Think about this. When you think about the Exodus account, God hardening Pharaoh's heart, what's the end of that portion of Scripture? The only person you could point to to save Israel was God, right? They, they, they walk out of Egypt, and as they're coming out, they're trapped. You got the Red Sea at their back, and at their front is the entire army of Pharaoh, and they're trapped, and there's no way out but God, and God parts the Red Sea. Yeah, he uses Moses, I get it. You could say Moses part of the Red Sea, but Moses doesn't do it without God. So the only person that people, not even Israelites, surrounding communities could point to. Did you hear about what happened at the Red Sea? Yeah, I heard about it. It's crazy, right? Yeah, had to have been God. That God of Israel, that's who can do that. Verse 19, you will say to me then, Paul says, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? Paul anticipates the question, the existential question of free will versus predestination. In other words, If God chooses some and rejects others, if he raises up Pharaoh only to take him down, what choice does anyone have? Well, Paul addresses that at one level in the next two verses. But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay? For the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. So at one level, what Paul is saying here is, listen, if you believe in God, and therefore you know that he's omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, he created all of us. So who are you to address God, to challenge God? Who are you to to question him? He does what he wants to do. Now, 
That argument works if you're talking to somebody who believes in God, particularly the God of the Bible. That's critical when you're talking about free will versus predestination, by the way, because a lot of people believe in God, and you have to ask them, which God? What God are you talking about? The, the bearded white dude that throws lightning bolts? Because that guy, I don't know what he's doing, but he's not the God I'm talking about. I'm talking about this guy. So that's one thing. But if you're talking to a non-believer, that argument, Paul's argument, falls flat because they don't believe in God anyway. So God didn't create anything because there is no God. But then Paul goes on. In verse 22, he says, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. In other words, God has patience. He has infinite long suffering. If you think about it, he could just create people who he knows are going to receive the gospel, but he doesn't. He creates all kinds. Some will receive the gospel, some will not. And Paul's here saying, think about it like this. What if God is going to endure much long suffering for vessels of wrath, but he'd rather that all chose him, but he knows not all will, but he'll have long suffering. And with those, he will still be able to show his power. Can we pull up Ephesians 1, verses 11 and 12? In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that he who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. See, God's working all things according to his will. That's the account of Pharaoh. But God's will doesn't take away our free will. Pharaoh had choice to make. It simply is stating here, as it says in Romans, that those who choose the path that leads away from God, God's going to use his power, and he's going to use them as well. Let's pull up Acts 17. 26 through 27. I think Lonnie referenced this last week or the week before. And he has made from one blood every nation of men. Does that not sound like the potter using one lump of clay to make both? He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. See, the gospel message is going to go out. And God, again, because he's not constrained by time or space, and he's omniscient, and omnipotent, he's not far from anyone. The whatever there is, seven point whatever billion people on the planet right now, he's not far from any one of them. And when you go back in history, all those that have passed away, not far from any one of them either when they were alive. But the point here is that God has determined their pre-appointed time. That means, guys, we're living in Littleton or the surrounding communities in the 21st century, that was pre-appointed. You're here in this time and place exactly as you were supposed to be. I know I, I get a little nostalgic and I tend to think of like, man, you remember the good old days? Like before cell phones and, you know, that kind of stuff. And it just seemed like life moved a little slower and wasn't so hectic. But here's the thing. That's not where God wanted me. That's not where God has me. He has me here now. And that is by design. And note that it says that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him. It doesn't say all are definitely going to find the Lord. God didn't make autom automatons in the hope that they might grope for him. But not all will. Now, if you would, flip back one chapter into Romans 8. Because this is really where Paul sets up this idea in verses 28 through 30. Romans 8, 28 through 30. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For him 
or sorry, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So let's unpack those verses a little bit more. 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. First of all, note that it says that we know. Paul doesn't say we wish. Paul doesn't say I hope you know. Right? Paul doesn't say I want you to know. He says we know. Well, how do we know? How do we know that all things work together for good? Well, if you're a believer, then you know that God sent his one and only son to die for you. He knew that you were a sinner in need of a savior and he sent you one. He sent you the only one, by the way. He didn't send you ten and you could pick one. He sent you one, Savior. So you can conclude from that that God probably has your best interests at heart. Now here's the funny thing about that is we don't always recognize that when it happens. Right? The loan falls through and you don't get that fancy car. Where's God? Don't recognize it. But he has your best interests at heart. Maybe he saved you from 10 years worth of debt. Or maybe the car was going to break down as soon as you drove it off the lot. I don't know. Maybe it was that relationship that never happened. And it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. Maybe God was sparing you from terrible pain. We don't always recognize the fact that God has our best interest at heart when things happen to us or they don't happen to us that we want. Think of the story of Jacob and Joseph, right? Jacob has the 12 sons. Joseph's one of the sons. He's sort of the favorite. The other brothers get sick of that, and they sell Joseph into slavery. Joseph ends up in Egypt. Kind of fast forward, Joseph becomes prime minister, basically, of Egypt. And he's storing up all the grain, right? And Israel's, there's a famine. So you got the, the brothers come down, and they don't recognize Joseph. And Joseph sort of toys with them and says, look at Bring your, bring your youngest brother, Benjamin, because they didn't bring Benjamin with him. And he says, you know, I'll, I'll wait. You guys go back, but I'm going to keep Simeon in prison. You guys go back and get Benjamin. And here you got Jacob going, man, I, I lost Joseph, because he thinks Joseph got eaten by, by wild animals, right? That's what the brothers tell him. He's thinking, I'm going to lose Benjamin, Simeon's in a prison. And we know the end of that story. Not only does Joseph come clean, shares all the grain, the family gets fed, they also come together. See, all things work together for good, as it says in Romans. And by the way, those 12 brothers become the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 29 of Romans 8, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now suppose that you had perfect knowledge, like God. Not all-powerful, not none of that, but just perfect knowledge. For you, playing the lottery wouldn't even be gambling, right? Every week, you just pick the right numbers. You'd know you won because you you have perfect knowledge. Every time, absolute certainty, you'd pick the numbers, off you go. See, the same is true for God. He's not up there hoping and wishing, ooh, I hope Dave becomes a believer. I hope, you know, I hope. That's not what he's doing. He knows. He's got perfect knowledge. He knows who's going to accept the gospel and who's not. So when he predestined, he knows who's going to accept that gospel to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what that means, to be conformed to the image of Christ. In Philippians 1.6, can we pull that up? I think this is the last slide I have. Maybe. Philippians 1.6, it says this, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. He knows who's going to receive the gospel, you do receive the gospel exercising your free will and that good work that's begun in you will be completed. And look what it says in the last part of verse 29, that he, Christ, might be the firstborn among many. Christ isn't going to be the only one. There are going to be people who believe in the gospel. This just states that Christ is the first fruits. And in verse 30, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. 
Again, by God's sovereignty, we have free will. We have free will to choose to react to his calling, to say it's a bunch of garbage or to say that is the way, the truth and the life. But because he's sovereign, he knows ahead of time who's going to react to his calling. That is who in Scripture gets referenced as the elect. And that's great, you say, or maybe your buddy says, but what if you're not part of the elect? What if you don't believe the gospel? Like, that seems a little harsh. Well, John 3, oh, this is, I think this is my last slide. Sorry. John 3, 18 through 20, says this. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. In other words, we're all given a choice. God actually demands it, whether people recognize it or not. He sent his son, his only begotten son, into the world. Everyone has a choice to make. When Jesus says he is the son of God and there is only one way to the father, you have a choice to make to determine was Jesus, if you take him at his word, you either think he was literally a lunatic or he actually is the son of God. I don't think there's anywhere in between. You can't simply say that he's just a good teacher. He was a really good guy. He wasn't just a really good guy. He either had to be certifiably insane or he is the son of God. Based on what he claims, I don't see that there's any space in between. And it says in our scripture in Romans that those God calls, he justifies, meaning the believers who have come and received the gospel message, he washed clean of their sins through his son, Jesus Christ. And it says those he justifies, he glorifies. The verb tense there in Romans 8, the tense here for glorifies indicates that it's taking place right now. See, again, God transcends that time-space continuum. So he doesn't experience events the same way we do. So God is looking at us, those of us that are believers, in terms of the fact that we're already in our glorified state and we are continuously glorified. That's what that verb tense means. Now, I have about 10 minutes to get you through Matthew 20, so flip over to Matthew 20. And while you're flipping, I'm going to give you a couple of analogies that I came across. These are not my own. I didn't make these up. But nonetheless, I think they're really cool. I think it might have been Chuck Smith who who used this analogy. Um, It's the analogy of the Rose Bowl Parade, and it speaks to the fact that God can experience everything all at the same time. God is, you guys know what the Rose Bowl Parade is, right? I think they still have that. I don't think COVID killed that either. But um, so the Rose Bowl Parade, everybody's standing there, they're watching the parade. God's like the Goodyear blimp, okay? So you got the people at the beginning of the parade, the first floats come through, and they're experiencing the parade at the beginning. God sees it. He sees all of it. These people over here at the end of the parade route, they still got like three hours before the first float comes by. They're just sitting there waiting and waiting. And of course, as the parade moves, These people are experiencing the middle of the parade. By the time they get to the end of the parade, these guys are just now getting to the first part of the parade. But if you think of God as a Goodyear blimp, he's seeing it all at the same time. He's watching everybody experience everything all at the same time. So if you use that analogy like life, by the time the end of the parade for these people, the end of life comes for them, these people are just getting born. But God's getting it all at the same time. So that's an analogy if you have a hard time with this time-space continuum thing. That's an analogy that you can think of for that. Now, the other one I'll give you more speaks to God's sovereignty operating with man's free will. Okay, it's not a perfect analogy, but it goes like this. You have two chess players. One has never played chess before, and they just learned the rules. Like how the little horsey guy goes up two and over one, and the pawn can only go like this, right? And the object of the game is to capture the king, and the queen goes anywhere she wants. But on the other side of the board is a master chess player. He is a life master at chess. He sees the board differently than the novice. He sees the game unfold, and he's like 18 steps ahead. 
His strategy encompasses the entire board. Now, that master chess player can influence the novice. The novice has free will to choose, as long as he works within the rules, he can move his pawn, he can move whatever he wants. But the master chess player can kind of influence how he's going to make moves, right? He can kind of force him into a corner. That's sort of the sovereignty and free will, if you think about it that way, okay? So now let's look at Matthew 20, and I'm going to, I'm going to read through Matthew 20, first 16 verses. This is the um, parable that Jesus gives. It's known as the parable of the workers in the vineyard, or some of your Bibles might say the workers paid equally. And I think you guys have probably read through this before, but let's do it one more time. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one hired us. So he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received the denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now you guys have probably read through that parable, I don't know, half a dozen times, a hundred times. My guess is you have no, never thought about it in the context of free will versus predestination. Maybe you have. I never had. Some say that this teaches about salvation and doing good works. Some say that it talks about deathbed conversions. I believe the parable addresses all of those arguments, but it doesn't support any of them. I do believe that the parable teaches us that faith and actively trusting God is rewarded by a God who is worthy of that trust. See, the men who waited around for work were not pursuing selfish pursuits. They didn't go to the bar. They didn't go find prostitutes. They didn't do any of that stuff. They trusted and they waited and they hoped. See, heaven is not going to be a place of petty jealousies. I believe we will be like those workers hired last, having no reason to boast in our efforts in front of a generous God. But let me break that parable into two pieces. The first seven verses. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give to you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour, and he did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said, Because no one hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So first of all, don't get hung up on the hours, the third hour, the sixth hour. If you don't know, there's a little rule of thumb. In, in um, Old Testament, the Jews considered by our clock 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., those are the 12 hours in the day. So any time in the Bible, not just here, if you read the third hour, just go three hours from 6 a.m. That's the nine, that's nine, we think of it as 9 o'clock. So when you, in, this, in this particular parable, the third hour is 9, the sixth hour is noon, the ninth hour is 3, and the eleventh hour is 5 p.m. So those last guys, the eleventh hour, they worked like an hour. Okay? Note, too, that it says that the landowner negotiated a denarius only with the first group. All the other groups, what did he give them? Whatever's right. He didn't settle on a, on a sum of money. He just said, whatever's right is what I'm going to pay you. Pretty brilliant. Now, you have to understand, it was customary in that time for day laborers to gather in one spot. They would gather in the hopes that a landowner, somebody who was in need of hired men, would come along and hire those men. 
it was customary to only do that once. So if you didn't get picked, it was sort of like tough luck. It's typical only to hire once. So most laborers would have gone home disappointed. Now, it's also important to understand that Jesus is giving this parable to Middle Easterners. And in Middle Eastern culture, there's this thing that we don't quite understand. Because see, here in the West, our culture is based on individualism and personal choice, right? We all love the John Waynes, you know, the Clint Eastwoods. Like the one man goes out against all and he perseveres and he, that individual ruggedness, that's the West. But the East is very collectivist and communal. In other words, in the East, you derive family honor through dignity, integrity, and in most cases, perpetuating religious traditions. And if you're not picked to earn a day's wage, you are shamed. And so you have to go back to your family in shame. And that deteriorates your communal standing. So when Jesus is giving this parable, he's not giving it to Westerners, although we're reading it today. But he's giving it to Easterners who would definitely appreciate the fact that the guys who didn't get picked first, and they stuck around for the third hour and the ninth hour and the eleventh hour, they would be sitting there going, oh man, like, I don't know what to do. Like I, and, but they had hope. And they had faith. And note that the landowner, the guys in the eleventh hour, could have just given them charity. Could have just said, hey, you guys have been staying here all day. Here's a, here's a couple of denarius or, a, a, you know, a whatever, a pence, a mite. A, you know, give them a couple mites. But he doesn't. He says, go work in the vineyard. Be useful. So that you can go home, not shamed, but that you were valuable today. Last part of this. So when evening had come, The owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is right and go your way. I wish to give this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. Does the last part of that not sound like God's sovereignty? And he'll have compassion on who he has compassion, and we're all created by God. God's the creator, so he'll do do what he wishes, right? So this is where the parable takes a surprising turn. I mean, I know when the first time I read this parable, I had the same thought as the dude tired first. Like, that's not right. But I grew up in the West where that doesn't seem right. Guys that work 12 hours in the field all day in the hot sun, they should get paid more. Note, though, that the landowner tells the steward to pay the guys who got hired last first. Do you know what that does? It tells you that the guys that got hired first, watch. Imagine if the guys that got hired first got paid first. They get the denarius and they're off they go. They're happy because they got what they negotiated. But they never see the other side of this. So it's very purposeful that the landowner, that God says, pay those last ones first. Do that. And look at what his response is to the guys who got hired first. He says, I didn't do you any wrong. I asked you. Would you work in my field for a denarius? And they said, yes. Okay. And what did I give you? A denarius. We agreed upon a denarius. I choose to give to these others what I gave to you, but it's my money. Shouldn't I be allowed to do with it what I want? Or are you arguing with me because I'm generous? It's a brilliant counter. Now, let me explain to you the difference between a paradox and a contradiction because this whole idea of free will, and this is where I'm going to sum it up, Free will and predestination. A contradiction I think we all know. It's an inconsistency or a logically incongruous statement. If I say there is no absolute truth, it's a defined fact. There is no absolute truth. Well, 
if there is no absolute truth, that statement itself cannot be true. That's an inconsistency, okay? That's the kind of like cyclical logic you got to think through if you're in my brain. But a paradox, in contrast, is a statement or proposition that seems self-contradictory, but in reality expresses a possible truth. The only one I can think of off the top of my head is in golf, you hit down on the ball to make it go up. That seems like a paradox, but I can tell you it's true. If you hit down on the ball, it will go up. So human free will versus God's sovereignty or predestination, this sort of Calvinistic viewpoint that there is no human free will, to the believer, it's simply a paradox. It's seemingly self-contradictory, but in reality, it's true. To the humanist or somebody who takes a naturalistic worldview, it is a contradiction. And I'm going to explain that. Somebody who's a humanist or a naturalist, they don't believe in God. There is no God. And they simply think that we're just complex biochemical organisms. We just emerge from the primordial soup, and this is who we are. We have higher level logic and reasoning, but we simply respond to external stimuli. Okay? We, we, we are bound by natural selection and adaptation, but there is no free will. Our synapses are simply firing, and because we like chocolate more than broccoli, we eat more chocolate. It's just a learned behavior. That's all we are. Our natural instincts are based on the external stimuli, just like the deer that runs when it smells a lion. So you see, absent God, human free will is simply an illusion at best. And anybody's assertion that it exists who's a humanist or a naturalist, it's a contradiction. You should challenge them on that. But with God, the problem becomes a paradox. Now think about this parable this way. The workers at the beginning of the day used their free will. When the landowner said, I'll pay you a denarius, they said, okay, free will. They could have said, look at the size of these three denarius for these, right? They didn't. You know, that's a joke, right? Okay, look, we're not, oh, we are on video. Okay, joke. Um, they could have said three. They didn't. They said, we'll take a denarius. Free will is exercised. The men who waited used their free will to linger, to wait. They exercised free will in the hopes of getting work. They could have easily gone to the bar. They could have easily gone to the brothel, but they didn't. At the same time, the landowner exercises his sovereign authority to pick whom he picks. In the first round, he specifically went out to hire men. Reread the parable after this. He specifically goes out to hire men. In subsequent rounds, he saw men. Doesn't say that he was looking to hire them. He just saw them. So the master exercises his sovereignty to hire more workers. Human free will is on display in how the men choose to spend their day. God's sovereignty is on display and that the master chose whom to hire and what to pay. See, how free will and sovereignty work together is our paradox. To the believer, it's a paradox. That they work together is difficult for us to understand. And note that the workers hired at the end of the day received their pay gratefully. They didn't complain. But the guys hired first, what was their argument? Not that the guys hired last should get paid less, right? It was that they should get paid more. Come on, God, it's all about me. See, the men hired first complained that they should have received more. The focus was on themselves, the selfward gaze. And they obscured their view of God's grace. So that's how I'm going to conclude today's message. If you don't like it, you don't believe what I said, I encourage you, don't stream any more digital content. Get into this, and then come talk to me. Okay? All right. Is Dan, are we doing one last song? Is Dan, Dan's here? One last song? All right.
I search the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise Treasures of faith Never enough Then you came along And put me back together Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing, nothing is better. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. Turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's no. Better than you, there's nothing Better than you, there's nothing Nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you, there's nothing Better than you, there's nothing Nothing is better than you. Lord, thank you for today. And I just pray for a blessing for everyone as they leave today and for safety. And Lord, that you would just um, apply what we've learned about this topic, Lord. Just a very difficult and challenging topic, Lord, that you've um, placed in our hands today, Lord. And we just pray that our hearts would uh, just absorb this, Lord, and you would... Um, just be glorified in each of our lives. Praise in your name. Amen.